God, we just we want to rise up and say you are good. Here we are in the middle of a pandemic, or we hope the late stages of a pandemic, and here we are. We're together. We were remembering together as a worship team the last time that we, well, the last Thanksgiving, last Thanksgiving that we tried our first online service, which was absolute chaos. But you were faithful then, 12 months ago, and you're faithful today, and we are sure because of your character you'll be faithful in 12 months from now and 12 years from now, and if need be, um, 1,200 years from now. You, you are faithful and good, and we're grateful for it. We know God. We read the news uh, headlines as well. The world is in this sort of um, discombobulated place. People are at odds with each other. There's uh, disagreement in opinions. There's a, a looming energy crisis. There's many, many things. Dis- instability in the Far East, China, Taiwan, all these sorts of things. There's things that are heavy on our heart, and we bring those to you in prayer. This morning, though, we want to rise up and give you thanks for big things and for very little things. And so, Lord, hear the praises, hear the thanksgiving of your people as as I go quiet and as they get a chance to type or as they get a chance to call out uh, the very things that uh, they're grateful for. So hear hear our gratitude, God. Jesus... Jesus, while the, while the world tries to make sense of his ex- its existence, what well, tries to figure out how to scramble into its own corner as much resources and as much stuff as, as it can, um, we believe there's a bigger, better story going on. We believe that you're the God who takes care of the needy. You're the one who looks out for the, for the heartbroken, for the sick, for those who mourn. And so in the middle of a pandemic, your people don't, don't start to scramble and think about, what about us? What's going to happen for us? We, we, because of the way you treated us and treat us, we, we think, what is it that we can do for these who would be at greatest risk? What is it that we can do for those who are feeling this um, separation most acutely? And so we thank you. We thank you for a life script that isn't about us. Everything else seems to be about us and And this is this release that we've got. And you've made our lives about you and about this great hope you have for us and for the whole of creation. It is so beautiful. So here our gratitude. Thank you for the privilege of being able to speak out to you. It does, I'm thinking this week, it's probably a bad illustration, but it's almost as though you taught yourself how to speak goldfish. Like it's, you're the creator of the the cosmos. The, The stars and the galaxies come into play because you said so. And then you choose to... I don't know, listen into English or you know, Arabic. You, you, you listen into Mandarin. And I mean, these things are like little creature noises that we make compared to who you are, goldfish noises. And yet, not only do you listen in, but you're, you, you, you take joy in them. You delight in hearing from your people. You, you actually command the worship and the praise and the thanksgiving from your little biped creatures like us women and men. So we give you thanks for, for that deep privilege, for giving us worth that way. In your name, Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Okay, we are hunting for, not really, we're finding joy in the jailhouse. We're looking at a book called Philippians, and uh, so we're just making our way through it. Not taking a break for Thanksgiving. going to put on the screen, I think, a, a top here. Philippians chapter 2 should begin to read it. Verse 19, Holy Spirit, Uh, Give us ability not just to be hearers of the word, but doers also. Okay, this is Paul writing to the people in Philippi, and he says this, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ, but you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him to you uh, as soon as I can, as soon as I see how things go with me. And I'm confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it's necessary to send back to you Epaphrodites, my brother, co-worker, fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed 
because he heard, you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. Amen. Hey, you ever been to somebody's house, like, like an event dinner? Maybe it was like Thanksgiving dinner, or it was like meet the parents uh, dinner, and the house is immaculate. Man, it's like pristine. Do you know what I mean? Like the countertops are pristine. You could eat off the floor. The windows are radiant, uh, super clear. The stainless steel appliances have no kid fingerprints on them, right? And there's little beeswax candles burning in the bathroom. It's like home and garden. Home and garden, right? Not house and garden. Home. Home and garden, the magazine. Help me out here. I don't ever that. You don't read it either. Home and garden magazine. You know what I'm talking about? It's like perfect. Sandy, so home and garden? No, you don't know either. And Okay, and then you go back to the same house, maybe four months later, because you became buddies, and you're like, hey, we're friends now, and you're going for a hike, but oh, I got to use your washroom. Can I use your washroom? She's like, uh, yeah. And you go in the door, and it's like hard to recognize the house that you were once in. You know what I'm talking about? Like the bed is unmade, the sheets are half off the bed, there's underwear on the floor, the bathroom, there's a bit of a stink to it, right? And the cat is up on the countertop licking up the remains from last night's dinner. And you're like, well, it's different, right? It's not quite home and garden anymore. And that's fair, because nobody wants to live in home and garden, right? That's no fun at all. You wouldn't want to live there, but you got a glimpse behind the curtain what real life is like, right? This is actually the way real people live, unfiltered, not photoshopped, right? No airbrushing. This is us. This is us. So most of the time when you read your Bible, you're sort of tuning into things that God's telling us to do, or you're learning about what God is like. And it's all kind of clean, right? It's all like good. It's like straight up in front of you and you're like, yeah, 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 this, this would make sense. But this week's passage is a little bit like walking into these family's house when it's not so pristine. It's not so home and garden. I don't know if you feel like that when you read this, but that's the way it hits me. But I really like it. I really like it because it gives us a glimpse into what Christian community actually looks like. So if you were brand new to church and you're looking around at all these like well-dressed people and handsome and beautiful people, you're like, man, they're, everybody's perfect, right? Gwen, not so much, right? No. Gwen's been around here a couple of weeks now and she knows the real truth about us. It's not all perfect, right? There's like real community going on here, but it's, it's something short of um, airbrushed and Photoshop. Anyway, this, this passage is look into the community that Jesus brings. Can I put it that way? The community that Jesus brings. And this particular passage points out two particular ingredients, essential ingredients, into a community that Jesus would, would bring. And these two things are these, these honest emotions and genuine friends. Honest emotions and genuine friends. So for some reason, honest emotions, some reason Christians fail at this. And I particularly am an emotional lightweight I had pygmy in my notes, but I think pygmy's politically incorrect, so I'm a lightweight when it comes to emotions. I'm not really good with my emotions. I don't, um, I'm not really mature. So I'm not speaking from a place of maturity on this, on this subject. I'm just going to try to hunt through the passage with you and notice some stuff and learn alongside with you. I think in part I'm not really great with my emotions um, because, well, it's kind of like, f- not fake Christianity, but it's distorted Christianity because it says like this, Well, I'm under the impression, and it's true, that Jesus wins, the big story, Jesus wins, so it doesn't really make a lot of sense to spend any time dealing with your emotions, because Jesus wins, Christ is risen, everything is good, it all works out. It's a waste of time to be like feeling emotions. But I'm just going to say it has not served me so well over my years, because I pretend like I don't have emotions, other weaker people do, but it piles up on me, like, like an outhouse right? And it just feels wrong for me to say, or at least odd for me to say things like, I feel sad, right? 
or I would like it if you would, like, these two statements seem beyond me, and so instead of saying them honestly, I just get passive aggressive. You know, I'm nasty and mean. It's really unsafe. It's really unfair. It's really unchristian. It's better just to own your emotions. This is what I'm feeling. And then, like, process the story that you're telling yourself from those emotions. But that, that would be a mature way of dealing with it. Emotionally healthy living. So this passage talks about these things. Let me just point them out to you. If you have your Bible open, that's cool. If not, you'll have to trust me. Verse 28 says this. This is Paul writing to the folks in Philippi. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him to you, because when you see him again, you can be glad, and I may have, did you see that line? Less anxiety. Less anxiety. Paul. Paul, who wrote like half the New Testament. He's anxious. He's like all a bundle of nerves. And you may or may not know this. I do. I read ahead. But in chapter 4, Paul says, Be anxious about nothing, but with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. Be anxious about nothing. And Paul, in chapter 2, is like, I'm anxious. Man, I am anxious. I could be a little less anxious if Epaphrodite goes home and gets home safe and sound. Right? It's, it's really kind of interesting that Paul admits to being anxious. Acknowledge it. In front of these people, he should follow his own advice, follow the counsel of the Holy Spirit. But here's the point. He's not there yet. He's going to get there, but right now I'm feeling anxious, and it's okay to say it out loud. Paphrodite, has got really sick. Almost died. Uh, and Paul, he was right there under Paul's care. And no doubt Paul prayed for him. Maybe even God answered Paul's prayers and other people's prayers for healing. And Epaphroditus got to live. And so super cool, Paul got to see God work. But it doesn't mean that Paul went through the whole experience zen-like. Right? Untouchable. Not it. He was anxious. He's still anxious. He just when Epaphroditus gets home and he gets the text message saying, yeah, he landed, he's going to be less anxious. That's, that's what he's saying here. I'll be less anxious. That's honest. Here's the second one. Uh, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, so that I didn't experience, did you see it? Sorrow upon sorrows. Sorrow upon sorrows. Have you guys been paying attention to this book? It's all about joy, 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 joy. Paul's like, rejoice in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice, 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 rejoice. It would seem like there's only one option here. It's joy. And in Allison, Paul's into sorrow upon sorrow. So let's just say it. It's not all joy for Paul. It's not all joy for you. Right? It's, it's just not true. God has spared him sorrow upon sorrow. Epaphrodites didn't didn't die, so it's not double sorrow, but Paul still has single sorrow. He's got sorrow, not sorrow upon sorrow. Well, what's with that? Well, let's just say it. Life is hard. Paul's losing his sight. We know that. Paul's um, in jail. He's, he's dependent on other people. Churches that he planted have, have forgotten about him. Maybe he's, had, maybe he's had a family member die. Right? For sure he knows some Christians that have been killed. So life is tough. Is there joy in the middle of a tough life? 100%. Yeah, yeah, Jesus came and gave us a hope beyond anything that we can experience here. So yes, we have a rock-solid faith. And also, sometimes life hurts. And expressing that is actually healthy. Saying it is actually what God designed you to say. It's, it's okay to not be okay sometimes. Don't stay there. Sometimes some people like to just like hunker down there, pitch a tent, build a house on, like, you know, Pity, sorrow, me. That's not it, but for, for a time. And when there's considerable loss, it may be a year or two or, or even a little bit longer. Where it's just, it's sorrow and it's, it's tough. It's okay to say, this is hard. It's hard. It's okay as a Christian. You could say, this is the toughest thing I've ever been through. That would be a Christian thing to say. Okay, third thing, last example, healthy emotions. I hope to send him to you soon. Do you remember this? I hope to send him to you soon as soon as I see how things go for me. So I'm going to send him to you, but just not yet, because I need him around. I need him close. How comfortable are you expressing what you need? How comfortable are you saying, this is what I could use from you? Because that would be an emotionally healthy, relationally healthy, for sure, way of, of being. See, Paul could have tried to be the big boy here, you know, his life is going south. But, you know, they need Timothy, so I'm just going to send Timothy on to them. But uh, Someone needs to be the adult in this relationship. Right? But I'll go without. But that's not what he does here. Right? 
Sometimes you do those things, you have to do those things, but other times you get to say, are you able to stay with me a little bit longer? I'm feeling kind of alone right now. I'm feeling isolated. Can, can you do that? Just saying those words makes my skin wrinkle. I'm so, not, it feels so weak to me, but I think it's one of the stronger things you could say is, I need this. Sandy, I, I need this. And, and when you do that as adults, you get to say, she gets to say, well, I can't do that this time, right? Because that's, you, you we're not going to coerce anybody into doing it. It's the way adult exchanges work. You ask, a person gets to say yes or gets to say no, but we actually are invited into a relationship of asking. That's part of what Jesus was saying, ask and receive. It wasn't just with God, it was actually with, with each other. Ask and receive, knock, door be open to you. Now, this is um, a picture of emotional health, what a community could look like under the name of Jesus. I've got to move on, but let me just sit this, this little plug. I want you to sometime read through one of the Gospels, maybe all four of them, and keep an eye out for the ways in which Jesus was emotional. Right? Do you remember, like, on the hardest day of his life, he said to three of his buddies, would you just please be with me? Would you stay close? Do you remember the part where he cries at a funeral? Do you remember the part where he kind of, like, goes a little ballistic at the temple? He's angry at the temple? Right? Like, he's, he's right in there. He's moved. He's a little shaken when people all walk away, leave en masse. Are you guys going to leave me too? Like, he's emotionally present. So emotions are, you may not feel like this, but emotions are a gift of God, actually a gift to us, a gift from God to us so that we can continue to take the shape of Jesus. I don't know if you feel like that. I kind of grew up in a family maybe where it felt like emotions weren't safe and so we avoided them, but actually that was a mistake. Gift of God. Okay, this is the second ingredient that we're going to get at here. Um, looking into this passage, which it feels a little bit like an unvacuumed house, and it's this piece about genuine friends. Honest emotions, genuine friends. This is part of what brings joy in the jailhouse, kind of the community that Jesus brings. So straight up, it's implied, and it's explicit, that Paul needed friends. Jesus needed friends. Isn't that really fascinating to you? Jesus could have just like floated out of a cave every morning and did a single back into his cave, but instead he chose 12 close buddies and other people walked close to him too, and he wanted to be around them. He needed them to be around and, and more than friends, Paul had partners in the gospel. Christian ministry needs team players. Christian life needs team players. Like, like, let's be in this together. Like, can I put it this way? A Jesus buddy. A Jesus buddy. You know? and, and a few of them. What does a, G- a Jesus buddy look like? Well, look at the passage. Um, she would go or he would go and, in your absence and represent you in a place and bring back good news. I hope in the Lord to send Timothy to you soon that I may also be cheered when I receive news about you. So Paul couldn't go somewhere. He had no clue when he was going to be able to go. Someone going to have to go in his place and Timothy would be the one who would represent and would bring back good news. That's a neat picture of a Jesus buddy. It used to be that Paul and Timothy would go together, and it was Paul and Timothy. Like Paul was the A guy, Timothy was the B guy. But now, now it's not that way. Timothy's got to go on his own. He's been watching Paul. And a good friend will act on your behalf. A good friend will have your back when you're not in the room, when you can't be there. What qualifies Timothy for being this kind of a Jesus buddy? This phrase. Um... He has genuine concern for your welfare. Isn't that neat? Here's the qualifying piece. He has genuine concern for your welfare. See, Timothy's not trying to figure out how to make money off this gig. He's not trying to sort of pour something in his bank account. Timothy, like Paul, believes that these believers are precious to the living God chosen by him and his delight, and God is shaping them into a new family, and Paul are part of Timothy's job and, and, and Paul's job is to help them come into the shape of Jesus together, to be this new family together. Timothy is a genuine friend to that end. He loves Paul. He loves God's people. He's going to do everything he can to keep people pointed towards Jesus. Genuine concern, genuine friends. I, did, I find it interesting, right? I find it interesting that Paul does not commend Timothy to the Philippian people. He said, like, he is a knock-it-out-of-the-park preacher. Mm, dude's got it. He is an anointed worship leader. No, he's a man of prayer. No, it's just this simple category of 
He genuinely cares for you. He's a visionary leader or other things that we might elevate. No, no, no. This. He has genuine concern for you. Watch for people like that. We have some of them around here. I have at least two people like, like that in, in my life here. One of them is Karen Rennie. I don't know if some of you won't even know who Karen Rennie is, but she is regularly reminding me of you. She'll take me these text messages. Did you know that? This person just has surgery. Did you know that? This person just has stroke. This, did you know that? This person's in the hospital. And you, know, you can be praying about this. She's just, she has genuine concern for you. She's, she's, uh, she works here. She's the one who cooked up the idea of divorce care in this place. She's the one who cooked up the idea of grief share in this place. She's the one who cooked up the idea of one-to-one ministry in this, in this place. Karen Rennie, so Jesus buddy. I don't think it's out of bounds for me to say that Karen just had surgery, just had her knee replaced on Thursday. She's out of commission for a couple of weeks. And if you wanted to express some genuine concern back, you, she's a card person. You could send her a card, and she's into all things Charlie Brown and Snoopy. That's Karen Rennie. The other person I was thinking about this morning in terms of being a Jesus buddy is a, is a, guy, named, it's a guy named Brad, Brad Weaver. He's not on staff here, but he's the new small groups coordinator, and he's done everything in his power to twist your arm in a Jesus Christian kind of way uh, into joining a small group. He's just doing He's got leaders going and leadership development thing going, and you could go here, and he is knocking on doors, and he's inviting people into things, and he's just this genuine concern for you because he knows this, that you can't grow up as a Christian. Okay, I'm going to say it this clearly. You can't grow up as a Christian without community around you. Oh, but I read my Bible and I pray. I'm good. No, you're not. You're not. It won't work. You need community around you. And we don't yet have a monastery on the property or a convent. So small groups is the next best option. Get into a small group. Brad, Jesus buddy. Epaphrodites is another Jesus buddy for Paul. So here's, I, just, I got a bit of a rampant imagination. I imagine church at Philippi, kind of like us, sitting around with masks on and arms folded, and they're saying, our friend Paul is in trouble. He's low. You can tell by his last letter, he's low. Why don't we get a gift together, and someone will take it to him, and maybe be with him for a month, two, could be three. Just going to be with him. Paul, thank you for being with us. Thank you for coming to us, but we're going to send somebody to go and be with Paul, it would be a good idea. So everybody go home and think about it. Talk to your spouse. Talk to your folks, whatever it is. Look at your finances. Whoever volunteers for this job, it's not going to be at little cost to them. So they're all praying, your kingdom come, your will be done. And Paphrodite says, I'll go. I'll go. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. (laughs) We're looking for Paphrodites around here. And if this isn't your home church, then I'm sure your home church is. People will say, I could do it. I'll do it. I'll go. Small group leaders and youth leaders and, and, and children ministry leaders. There's actually a couple of jobs here at the church that, that we're looking for qualified people for. This isn't to manipulate anybody, not at all. You need to consider the calling of God on your life and see if this is the right time for you to say yes to something. Or, you know, because you can't say yes to every request, right? But it, it is believable that God would be raising up from within this congregation people who would step into the needed vacuums, voids that we've got here. Healthy, inspired, energetic people who will say, I'll go. I could do it. So these are the sorts of things that happen in a healthy Jesus community, right? There's needs expressed, and people go home, and they pray, and they think about it, and then they they offer. And then what would happen is that the church would then sit down and sort of say, is this a legit thing? Like, is Epaphrodite in a good place to do this? Is he the kind of presence that we want? Is he going to be able to take care of Paul's needs and his own needs? Or is Paul going to have to babysit him? And so they have, the church has to do like emotion or good discernment on that process. But, but that's the story, right? I'll go. I'll do it. Jesus, buddy. I was thinking this week that we, we got a bunch of them around here. But I'll just point two out this morning. It would, be, it would be Sarah and Lynn who lead the worship up here. Right? Like, they're like, I'll do it. Like, they're the ones that come up with the songs, and they're the ones that come up with the team, and they're here on Thursday nights and practicing. We're like begging them to take night, uh, you know, a week off. Like, it's time for you to, we don't want to burn you out. We want you to not go, not go fast. We want you to go long. So, so take a break. And so Sarah and Lynn have been just these players. Like, for the whole year, there was almost a year where we were apart. Not quite. 
but close to it, where there's hardly any worship at all. And they're like, can't we worship? Can't we? And they're on me about it. Like, they're like, come on, buddy, let's do this thing. And then, and then last, last Thanksgiving was our first online service. And it was horrible. It was awful. It was like we were broadcasting from a submarine. It was like, whoa, 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 whoa. So Phil, I don't know if he's going to do it, but he was going to actually shoot some of that out today, which would have been really nasty. But it was really, we were, we were like online in a tuna can, and it just sounded awful and didn't, didn't, didn't get better till maybe, well, we got a new system, and then it kind of worked out. But they've been fearless. They've just been like, let's do it. And they would come back, and they'd be like, that was awful. You want to do it again next week? Yeah, for sure. We'll do it again next week. And it was just this beautiful spirit, Epaphrodites. I'll go. So sometimes in the past, I've preached about friendship, and I seem to create a little bit of a problem, and people... People, like, they go into this sad place. And they say stuff like, I don't have any friends. I suck. I don't have any Jesus buddies. Oh, I wish I had a Jesus buddy. And that's a myth. Hey, I'm going to try to fix that at the end here. Because Jesus said these words, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. So Jesus actually, I mean, we could do it. Shoot, it's not in the budget this year, but we should get, we should get like, T-shirts that has friend across it. Like, you know, like, that you would begin to see yourself not, not just looking for a Jesus buddy in your life, for sure, but you'd actually also have this like friend t-shirt or buddy. That's because that's who you are. That's who Jesus made you to be. This past Tuesday, in this building, we did a celebration of life for a guy named George. And some of you in Uxbridge might know George. He was a, he's a guy that lived life with some extra challenges. He lived in group homes. Uh, George, when he was, until he was 17, his dad was in the house, his dad was his hero, and, and his dad taught him how to work with machines and cars and engines and trucks and tractors and all that. He just loved it, right to the day of his death. Loved big tractor pulls and that sort of thing, George. But at 17, his dad died, and uh, he was put into an institution, Kingston, somewhere. I don't know how he wound up in Durham Community Care, but he's in Durham Community Care here for the rest of his life. At one point in his stay in the Uxbridge area, a family volunteered to take, them, take him, George, into their house. It's called um, family home. A group home, right, is an option, and then there's family home. So for 10 years, George got to go into this family's house. It's a pretty emotional, powerful story. George, George, George would introduce himself as Buddy George. I'm Buddy George. That was the way he would say. Your Buddy April? I'm Buddy George. Your Buddy Dick? I'm Buddy Andrew. It was Buddy. Everything was Buddy. So even when he was driving to the house to like audition for whether he could stay with his family, he says to the guy, like there's a husband and wife and then a, and a child, but George is older than the guy. And he's like, what do I call you, Dad? This is what George says. And uh, Rick says, you can call me Buddy Rick. So Buddy Rick, Buddy George. George is a bit of a, not a bit, he was a real literalist. So whatever you said, that's exactly what you meant. So when he got to the house, he really wanted to help out. And so he said, what's my job? What's my job? And so Rick said, well, he never rakes the grass, but when I cut the grass, you can go rake the grass. And, uh, and then get the wheelbarrow, put the grass in the wheelbarrow, and then just throw it over the back fence. So first time out, um, Rick cuts the grass, George rakes it all up, and then he can hear about 10 minutes later, he's on the other side of the lawn, he can just, get over, get, get over. And so... He's trying to get the wheelbarrow over the fence, right? Rick's like, no, no, dude, no. And another, another time, the, the, the wife, the mom was saying, she, um, George went flying out into the lawn for something, it, actually right into the garden because Rick was rototilling, and he was so excited, and Rick said, go back and get the boot, your boots on. So he ran back into the house, and he tracked all this grass and stuff all into the house. And so she says to him, George, you've got to vacuum the grass yeah, yeah, central vac with the power nozzle. She said we had these beautifully, like a baseball diamond, just as far as the central vac would reach in the backyard. Just pristine. Such a beautiful picture, right? Buddy George, Buddy George. One of the most powerful stories that they told was um, they were, they, the first Christmas that they had with George in the house, they took him down to the Santa Claus parade. So even at 45, George was a Santa person. Santa was a big deal for George. And so 
parade. He's just bopping, and one of the floats is going by, and they're playing some rock music, and George is like air banding, air guitar, whatever, with them. And then he's at, I don't know if you know Oxbridge at all, but like right by the Max Milk, or what used to be coffee time, the new culvert. He's right about there. And then Santa comes around the corner at Pizza Pizza. So there's about 500 people between him and George. And George goes, hey, Santa, it's Buddy George. And, and, and Santa doesn't miss a beat. Santa says, and I am coming to your house this Christmas Eve. And he goes, well, Santa, I've moved. I live, I've, I live with Rick and Judy now. <laughs> and this is this beautiful picture. And he says, and I'll be there. It's just the way that George saw himself. It's Buddy George. It's Buddy George. I'm, I'm, I'm your buddy. You know, I, here's what I'm hoping for this, this Thanksgiving. You hear this stuff about genuine community. And, and, I, and I do believe that God will put Jesus' buddies in your life. And I bet you if you take some time this Thanksgiving Sunday to think about it, you can come up with some names. But I, just as important, maybe more important, Maybe before you can love your neighbor, you've got to love yourself. Just as important, I want you to know that you, your buddy, that Jesus has made you a friend, and you can act out of that. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thanks for the privilege of calling us into community. It seems such a curious group of people to be friends with and family with, but that's exactly the way you roll. You take strangers, and you put them together, and you say, okay, by the Spirit, by the power of my Spirit, I'm going to make you into something that you never, ever could have been on your own together. So watch out. We pray that you would be doing that in our midst. And Lord, for those who are far, far away from us, feeling, uh, for whatever reasons, distance and and disconnection, we pray that this would be a day where um, they encounter a Jesus buddy, where we reach out, not just looking to our own interests, but actually having genuine concern for those you've put into life with us. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, please stand. I'd like to speak a word of blessing over you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the friendship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you this day and tomorrow forever. Amen. Amen.